Hey, advanced algebra students, let's look at how the skills we've been doing with equations might help you out in science. Now, these two examples are a little tricky, maybe even trickier than what you might see on the GED science test. You probably see these same skills at a slightly lower level, but super, super useful for college. If you're going on to take chemistry or physics in college, you will need these skills. So first one says the equation K equals one half MV squared gives the kinetic energy of an object with a mass of M and a velocity V. Solve the equation for M. So first thing I'm gonna do is just copy this guy down. But since it said to solve the equation for M, I'm just gonna use a different color for M so you can see something. You might wanna do that in your notes as well. Now this is an interesting example because they've told us to solve for M, but they don't give us the two pieces of information we would want if we were gonna solve for M. We would want to know, well, what's K and what's V? And in science class, they do this a lot. They'll solve for a letter, for a variable in this case, and move the equation around without plugging in any values. And then once the equation is in the form they want it, then they plug in values. Again, this is a skill used in science class very commonly. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for M. That just means get M by itself, right? Right now, of course, K is by itself. So this equation is currently solved for K. Now you can see that there's two things hanging out with M. There's a one half and there's a v squared. We're going to need to get rid of both of those in order for m to be alone. The first thing I want to get rid of is that one half multiplier. And I have a nice trick for you advanced level students. To get rid of fractions that are multiplying, you can do something really nifty. You can multiply by what we call the reciprocal. The reciprocal of a fraction is the fraction on its head. So right now we have the one on the top of our fraction. So I'll put one on the bottom and we have two on the bottom in the denominator. So I'll put one on the top and you might say, well, why are you doing that? Well, think about it. Dividing by two and multiplying by two cancel. Of course, multiplying one and dividing by one are a little silly, but still they're the same number. So they would cancel. And so by multiplying by two over one, I'd be getting rid of one half. Now, whatever I do, to one side of an equation, I must do to the other side. So I'm gonna jump across and I'm gonna multiply by the same number. But I want you to notice something with this particular fraction. It didn't have to do this, but this one does. Two over one is not as simple as that number could be, right? If you have two one whole things, that's just the same as two. So what I'm going to just do just to make my life easier is multiply the left-hand side by two. And of course that means the same as multiplying by two over one. Now let's see what our new equation will be. Now, a lot of students will say, well, I don't know what two times K is. And I say, well, your life is actually easier if you don't know what two times K is. You don't have to do any scratch work. You don't have to think about it. You just literally write two K. And it's a really good habit, you guys, to keep the capitalization the way it is. So I have a capital K, so please keep it a capital K. Now on the other side, multiplying by one half and multiplying by its reciprocal, two over one, cancel. And so what am I left with? The MV squared. I'll keep my M blue so you can see that. And then there it is with V squared. Now, a lot of students would say, hey, Kate, there's a square that I want to get rid of. And so let me square root in order to get rid of the square. And I would agree with you if all you were trying to get rid of was the square. But that's not what you're trying to get rid of. You have an M and it's shoved up against a V squared. M is not being squared. So I don't need to get rid of the square. M is being multiplied with V squared. So I need to get rid of the thing multiplying with M. I need to get rid of V squared. Now, how do you get rid of something? You do the opposite. So the opposite of multiplying is dividing. I'm going to divide away V squared. And you say, can I do that? Absolutely, you sure can. As long as you jump across the equal sign and do the same thing. So I'll divide by V squared over there. And now let's see what our new equation will be. Well, multiplying by V squared and dividing by V squared, they might be 
ugly numbers, whatever V squared is, I don't know, but that's still opposite. So it'll still cancel. And I'm going to see that M is alone, just like I wanted. Now, fair question. You could say, Kate, what is 2K over V squared? I have no idea. And I don't know either. There's no way for me to know until I know what K and V are. But that wasn't my goal. My goal here was just to get M alone. So I did. And so what is M equal to? It's equal to 2K over V squared. Now this is done. This is a correct answer, but it is usual, especially in science, to have the letter that we're solved for on the left. And so you're more likely to see it written M equals 2K over V squared. And even though this is ugly and it scares you, it's done, you guys. M's alone. You've done what you've been asked to do. And so a lot of times in science class, like I said, you'll move this equation around. You'll solve for a particular variable. And then we'll have a bunch of problems where we know what K and V are. But first, you put it in this form. A nice job. Now I have seen solving literal equations, as this skill is called, on both math and science. But this one was a complicated example, like I said. So this might be more challenging than what you'll see. Let's look at the next example. And actually, this one's simpler than the last one. So don't let all the language freak you out. A lot of times, the language there is just to help you make sense of algebra. So it's actually going to clue us in here. So take a look. It says the formula A is equal to, and look at that little triangle. It's like triangle V. The triangle symbol in math or science is change. Like if I had $5 one day, and then the next day I had $15, my bank account balance changed. How much did it change by? Well, it went up $10, right? If I go from five to 15. So I changed by $10. That's the idea there. Knowing that, let's read this again. The formula A equals change of V over change of T can be used to find the acceleration A of an object given the change in its velocity, change of V, and the time that has passed, change in T, also known as change in time. According to the Ultima website, the Ultima GTR race car can reach a velocity of 26.8 meters per second, 2.8 seconds after taking off. So that just fun fact is 60 miles an hour. After 5.8 seconds, the car can reach a velocity of 44.7 meters per second, which is about 100 miles an hour. What is the acceleration to the nearest tenth of a meter per second squared of the car during the interval between 2.8 seconds and 5.8 seconds? So it looks complex, but they did give us a formula. So let's start by just copying that down. Acceleration is equal to change in velocity over change in time. Now this formula is really interesting because whether you realize it or not, this is a slope. <laughs> we do the same thing when we do the slope formula. The slope of a line is equal to change in the y values over change in the x values. You might say, Kate, that's not what the formula sheet says. It says m is equal to y2 minus y1 for slope and x2 minus x1. And I would say, yeah, yeah, but that is change, right? If I wanted to know how much the y values had changed, I would take the second y value and I would subtract away the first, just like our bank account. If I wanted to know how much my bank account had changed, I would take the new balance, $15. I would subtract out the old balance, $5. And I'd say, oh, that's a $10 change. We're gonna do the same thing here whenever we see the change symbol. We'll take the new minus the old. So the change in velocity is going to be the new velocity minus the old velocity. In our problem, we see that this race car can get to a velocity of 26.8 meters per second in 2.8 seconds. But then after 5.8 seconds, we get up to a velocity of 44.7 meters per second. If we're going to look at the change between those two points, we're going to need to take the new velocity, 44.7, and subtract the old velocity, 26.8.
And that will tell us how much the velocities changed by, how much did it move, how much did it rise. And we'll do the same thing with time. The first velocity they gave us was what the car had reached after 2.8 seconds. The second velocity was after 5.8 seconds. So we'll take the new time, 5.8, we'll subtract the old time, 2.8. And then, nice, 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 even on the science test, you'll get a calculator. So I could type this entire thing in. Fraction bar first, 44.7 minus 26.8. And if you prefer to deal with the change in velocity first and just simplify the top yourself and then change in time on the bottom and simplify the time yourself, you can do that. But 5.8 minus 2.8. And we get this 5.9666, yada, yada, yada. And now we have the acceleration and we've been asked to find the acceleration, right? What is the acceleration? So we have the right thing, but let's make sure we round it to the place we've been asked to round it to. So they say they want us to round it to the nearest 10th of a meter per second squared. And don't get weirded out by the meter per second squared thing. That's the unit for acceleration, just like if I measured the size of my room, I'd measure in square feet. That's the unit for the size of a room. The unit for acceleration here is meters per second squared. But the point though, for the rounding is that they've asked me to round to the nearest 10th. Now this is an interesting one to round to the nearest 10th. And another reason I wanted to give this one to my advanced level student, because the 10th place is after one decimal. So I have 5.9, but I always have to ask myself, am I closer to 5.9 or am I closer to the next number that goes to the tenths place? Well, considering the next number, the one I'm about to throw away, I'm more than halfway through my digit system, right? The middle of the digit system is five. So that's when we start rounding up. So we need to round up 5.9, but a lot of students struggle with that. Because they're like, what comes after nine? 10, is this 5.10? You know, ignore the decimal for a second and think about what would come after 59. It wouldn't be 510, right? What would come after 59 would be 60. And we see the same thing here. After 5.9 comes 6.0. And a lot of times students will want to drop that zero, but don't drop that zero. You're communicating something to me, especially in science class, we don't drop the zeros. If I asked you to round to the 10th, I want you to write a number that communicates to me that it's accurate to the 10th place. And so I'm going to leave that zero in the 10th place so I communicate something about my accuracy. So that's 6.0 meters per second squared. And again, you would need to know this for science class, how to write this, but that wouldn't be part of the deal on the GED test. That's not what they're trying to test from you. But yes, 6.0 meters per second squared. All right, you guys, we did very challenging work, but what I want you to see is these same concepts we've been learning are applicable in so many situations. Like there's a few base algebra skills that we use again and again and again and again. So I really want you guys to stop being so intimidated by algebra and realize that it's really just like three, four basic skills that we're applying in so many situations. All right, strong work, super proud of you and uh, happy learning.